In researching homophobia and gender norms in schools, we found resources in our own school. Mr. Eugene Kelly is the Director of Gender and Sexuality Center here at ESU. Mr. Kelly, could you please tell us about your job title and what you do for our school? Sure. Um, so just this past uh, July, uh, ESU made the decision to uh, consolidate some different operations on campus. Part of the center's mission is to provide sort of as, as many opportunities as possible for folks to engage around issues related to gender norms, gender roles, expectations, sexuality, um, homophobia, you know, transphobia, biphobia, those sort of things. Um, through dialogue, through discourse, through just awareness, celebration, and to create as much of a safe space as possible for people to come in and just relax and chill and be in a space that they can be themselves. By providing the space that is open and affirming to lots of different people, you'll be surprised at how many people will come in and just chill and talk, and people who maybe never have any you know, connection before that, and as a result end up feeling really uh, connected to ESU in a way that maybe they didn't before. Um, I, I think that when we're, when we're dealing with discrimination and homophobia and sexism and those sort of things, when we're not talking about those issues, it makes people feel as though that their needs and their issues are invisible. And to me, that's just not acceptable for any institution of higher education. So as a professional who works in the education field, do you, do you think it would be easy to identify if a student's having a hard time with their identity? I think, that, I think that a lot of people tend to share their difficulties in more anonymous sort of social media-y settings. So, so I don't think students are as open necessarily. What I try to do is, if a student is new in the space, I will always be like, hey, have I met you before? Oh, I'm, I'm Dr. Kelly, you know, I help run the center. And people go, oh, that's great. And then they at least know there's a professional resource. Because if we're not visible about that stuff, people might not even know where to go. I think part of what I try to do is, is recognize that, you know, lots of people can be struggling with lots of different things and might show that in lots of different ways. I teach a lot about the way that we handle stress and the way that um, we learn effective coping. And I think what happens is during these years, so for folks who are typically coming to college, kind of traditional age, like 18 to 22-ish, um, it's your first experience mainly with other people who are struggling with the same things and therefore we develop, can develop similar coping mechanisms. For example, choosing to drink or choosing to use drugs. But uh, forgetting that, you know, if now all of a sudden every Friday comes along and I can, the only way I can cope is if I get blasted that night, that leads to dependence in the future. So we can learn the better coping skills now. But it's hard to do that if we can't get people to self-identify. Do you feel that homophobia has become more or less of an issue in education recently? And how <laughs> can this issue be addressed? I definitely think that homophobia and biphobia and transphobia has become more, uh, maybe not prevalent isn't the right way to say it. I think that we've probably struggled with this issue for a long time. When the country elected President Obama in 08, um, I think a lot of us felt like, okay, finally, we're finally you know, breaking down some of that stuff. And, and I think that for many liberal progressive folks, we stepped back and we rested a little bit, which was good, but I don't think anybody kind of re or thought there was possible that we would end up electing a president who, and just from a fact-based perspective, you know, it assumes that, um, <clears throat> you know, LGBT people are less than. Um, and that sort of emboldens people, that allows people to feel comfortable enough to share things that maybe before socially would have been like a faux pas. Now it's like, oh, well, you know, the president can say, grab him by the blank, so why can't I say this? Or why can't I be this? So, so more people who might have been more closet, closeted in their homophobia, I think now feel a little bit more emboldened. Um, from an educational system, frankly, to be honest, I think that we are extremely, extremely unprepared, um, especially in K-12 arenas, for dealing with homophobia and bullying um, in those environments. I always remind people of this, the state of Pennsylvania does not have a non-discrimination law that covers sexual orientation and gender identity. So what that means is, if I got a job at any place in the country, or in the state, um, tomorrow, if I told, came in today, put a picture of my partner and I, not that I have one, but if I did have one, on my desk, um, I could be fired that day and my boss could look at me and say, we don't want your people here, and I have no legal recourse for that. Why would I ever want to be out as a K-12 educator? when the next day I could be fired from my
job. So you've got generations of young people who are being raised in, in isolation, where they don't have role models, they don't have openly gay and lesbian people to look up to. Um, so we exist in a vacuum. Um, so selfishly, as a, as a collegiate educator, we're inheriting at the college level people who are not prepared to handle that they may have a gay roommate or that their professor might be a lesbian, you know, because they've never been exposed to that. Because many K-12 education systems can't talk about it or don't feel like they can talk about it or aren't prepared to talk about it. Just as a statistic, 20 years ago when I was in graduate school, I did a research project on, on LGBT youth suicide. And at that time, the research was showing that LGBT youth were three times as likely to attempt suicide when compared to heterosexual counterparts. That was 20 years ago. So in the last 20 years, that number has gone up to five times as likely. So something has to happen if we're going to continue having people taking their own lives or being killed through anti-gay violence, um, you know, until we address that. And it's only going to get worse. Throughout your experience in education, have you witnessed any school rituals that appear to mock or negative, negatively portray homosexuality, similar to the rituals discussed in the book Do Your Fat? So from a ritual perspective, I think you know, when we think about the ways that we, that we um, divide people by, by gender. So think, for example, like I, I've seen many schools do like Mr. and Miss pageants. You end up with men who will often dress as women. Um, in order for comedic effect. What ends up happening is men oftentimes who decide to dress up as women play it off as if they were very sissy in terms of like being a, a quote unquote sissy gay person, um, which only then solidifies stereotypes and homophobia about people who sort of transgress outside of typical gender boundaries. I don't think people are waking up and going, how can I figure out a way to really hurt those LGBT people? I think it's a lack of awareness about things like, oh, well, when I choose to put on a dress, what am I actually conveying to people? The encouragement is to cross the gender boundary for laughs is definitely one of them. Other rituals that, again, have a what we would call um, like a heterosexist bent in the sense that um, the expectation is, is that in order to participate in this, you need to be heterosexual or you're assumed to be heterosexual. So things like dances but let's pretend that there's a fraternity that's deciding to sponsor a formal. Are the brothers permitted to bring men to the formal? So if there's an openly gay person who's in the fraternity, or is the expectation you have to bring women? You know, so, and right there, I don't think they're being intentional, like we don't want gay people here, but they're just not thinking, what is the possibility that people who are here might not be heterosexual? <laughs> and if not, how are we welcoming those folks? So again, I think the more we talk about this, the more that we provide education, the more that we get people kind of engaging around this, they can realize, oh wait, wow, I never thought that we were, when we sponsored Mr. and Miss, or when we sponsor Homecoming Royalty, what we're really saying is you need to be male or female. I don't think we're, we, we haven't gotten to that depth yet. What impact do you think sexuality has in classrooms of youth? Everybody has a sexuality. Everybody. Um, we just don't tend to talk about the, what, what many researchers call the social construction of sexuality. We don't, we don't tend to talk about that in heterosexual people. So we think of heterosexuality as a default setting and we don't properly educate people about what does it mean to be sexual. Um, like for example, tons of research right now that's showing that more and more and more young people are delaying marriage. So the idea of the expectations, for example, of heterosexuality being um, marriage, home ownership, children, is really different for most millennials and Gen Z people of today's generation. From a gay and lesbian sexuality thing, very interestingly, um, the, the uh, legalization of same-sex marriage in 2015 became a watershed moment. Now we're into a period right now where we're talking about what's called homonormativity. The idea that if you are a gay or lesbian person and you are not thinking about marriage, that there is something wrong with you. That you should be thinking about long-term relationships from a sexuality perspective. But there's a really interesting way that we're, that youth are particularly thinking about and experiencing sexuality as a concept. From a, from a sex perspective, I think, unfortunately, more and more people are, are experiencing sex at younger and younger ages. Even though it's not a pregnancy issue, we're dealing with consent issues and we're dealing with lots of other things that are a result of the fact that more and more people are starting sex earlier in their lives.
So how can you and other educators help all students get along regardless of their sexual orientation or gender? As an educator and as a person of privilege, okay, I have the responsibility to make sure that environments that I create are safe, welcome, and affirming for all students. Um, and, I, and, and at a school like East Stroudsburg or at any high school or elementary school in the country, that is what I think is inherently what educators need to be doing. Because if you can't provide a safe environment, people are not going to learn. If they can't learn, what are they doing in school? So one of the ways I think that we need to do that is by talking more about these topics, by getting educators to feel comfortable with, you know, with, with creating discussions or experiences where heterosexual and, and gay and lesbian students can talk, um, where people can be out. Uh, where people can be real about who they are. Um, you know, I remember walking through and seeing boyfriends and girlfriends kissing goodbye when they split up to go to class. You know, I never once saw a same-sex couple do that. So I think that, that, that the ways that we have to do that, first we have to get over our own fears, we have to get over our own discomfort, um, learn a little bit more for ourselves, you know, start up safe zone training programs, those kind of things where people can become educated and allow people to make some mistakes, and that's okay. If teachers were to understand one thing about gender, sexuality, and homophobia in schools, what do you believe is the single most important thing for them to know? Oh my gosh. I would say that none of these identities are choices. People experience lots of variations. They experience attraction as a variation. They experience behavior as a variation. You know, but but you know, be who you are, or, or choosing to tell people who you are. That's the choice. The choice is in disclosure. The choice isn't in being. You know, I'm gay, whether or not I tell people that I'm gay or not. But the choice comes into the disclosure. The choice doesn't come into who they are. And I think that when the climate that you're in forces that choice, then that's the part we can change. But if the culture is dictating to you that you can't tell people who you are because you're afraid of getting hurt or getting killed, then that's the problem. And that's the part we can affect. And that's the purpose of being in a university, is to experience things that are different than who we are.